this is another We'll Talk with Artists. The artist that we're featuring today is Carol Falk, and she is amazing, and I'm so happy to have her here. For those who don't know Will, even though it seems like most of everyone does, he is a very accomplished artist as well, photographer, and he retired from the National Gallery of Art, and he is also a very well-known art historian. Thanks, Reagan. Uh, thanks for being our moderator. Uh, Reagan's basic job after uh, introduction is to kind of keep us all in line. And after Carol and I complete our conversation of 20 to 30 minutes, we'll open it up for questions and it'll be Reagan who will need to see you wave your hand or something to indicate you want to ask a question, then she'll unmute you and we'll proceed from there. Um, so yes, Reagan introduced me and I don't think I need to say more about myself because tonight's uh, purpose really is to get to know Carol Falk and her uh, work uh, and uh, herself a little better. Um, I just will say that the purpose of this series is while COVID-19 has kept us closed uh, at the Circle Gallery, we want to continue to both provide interesting and worthwhile program to all of our members and the community at large, but we also want to give our member artists uh, a way in which they can um, spread the word about who they are and what they're trying to accomplish in their work. And I get the privilege of selecting them. And uh, I've known Carol and her work for some time, since even before I started to exhibit my work at the MFA. And I've always been very interested and impressed by her work. And so um, we're going to jump right in. Unless, Carol, do you want to say anything before we begin? No. OK. Uh, Carol is um, a very discreet and uh, poised uh, uh, artist. And so I may have to work a little bit to get her to open up. And so I'm going to take a, a turn that I did not forewarn her about. Oh, not fair. Oh, yes, it is, because that's the way you get a lively conversation. OK. Now, because I didn't forewarn you, uh, if you want more time to think about the question, or if you do feel that you don't want to address it, that's fine. But the more I thought about you, as I know you as an individual and your art, I kept coming back to the fact that you uh, had uh, a family to raise and uh, a husband to uh, support in his uh, career, which was an impressive one. But you continued to produce art through all of that. So my question is, did being a wife and mother in any way affect your art or give you ideas or inspiration or motivation as an artist or not? Or was it just something that was sort of part of your life and art was another part? Yeah. I, I think it was the major part of my life, and I had to accommodate what I was going to do to the needs of the family. At least that's the way I envisioned it back in 1963 when I was married. Um, so all the paths I took in art were serendipitous. Um, one experience led to another. Uh, I started out in high school taking classes on Saturdays at the Art Students League in Manhattan. And at the time, I never realized that was a famous place or that the Sawyer brothers who taught there were famous artists. It was just part of the scene. I took figure drawing there. I have no idea why, um, because I didn't know anything. Uh, <laughs> not sure if that helped or not, because I'm not really interested in doing representational uh, art, particularly of people. I'm much more interested in the natural scene and what's eternal. Um, anyway, uh, after... Did, did the kids, did having children or um, uh, hearing your husband talk about the things that he was doing in his research or in his practice of medicine. Did any of that in any way find its uh, path into your art? 
Well, since he started out as a gynecologist, I guess I could have done vaginas, but... <laughs> Giving that, Corbet a run for his money? Giving what? Corbet a run for his money then? No. no. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. Um, well, let's take up the serendipitous aspect. You mentioned that uh, okay. your, your art career has been sort of ser serendipitous and you started at the Art Students League. And right. you started with figurative drawing, but right. I have never seen any of your no. figurative work. Well, that's because I wasn't terribly successful at it. Um, we pursue what we're good at, right? Um, interestingly enough, it never entered my mind to become an art major in college, I guess because my parents told me that be a good idea to be a nurse or a teacher. Those were good professions for women. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I was pretty good in English, I decided I would major in English Lit, which I did. And I never took an art course in college. And that sort of interests me at this point. Um, after I was married, and I was taught for a couple of years. And when you became pregnant in those days and started to show, you couldn't teach anymore. And so I was home for a couple of months with nothing to do, kind of nice actually. And I decided to take an art course. And somehow I found out about this woman who was teaching pastel, pastel art. So I did that. Again, knew nothing about anything. Did that for a short time and I really enjoyed it. And then after I had children and, ha and we moved to Rockville, um, I thought, gee, maybe I can find babysitting. And it just so happened that a local church was offering babysitting on a weekday. This was most unusual. And uh, I signed up for it and I found a rec department course in Chinese painting. So I said, okay, I'll take that. So for a couple of years, I did study Chinese painting and I learned how to grind watercolor sticks and practice Asian calligraphy, Chinese actually. Um, and I think that's what started me on the path to, to my aesthetic, to appreciating negative space and minimalism and strong, strong marks. Um, then we moved to Annapolis to be closer to our boat. Carol, before you talk about Annapolis, um, I, if I may, did anybody up to that point say to you, you know, you've got a, a talent uh, or re any aspect of what you were doing encourage you because they thought that you had potential to become a serious uh, artist? Other than my mother, my husband, no, I don't think so. Okay, well, still, that's, so none of your teachers, but people close to you whose opinion you respected uh, encouraged you. That's good. Not, a, not everybody gets that. Uh, Absolutely. Right. So when you came to Annapolis, did you get involved with uh, some of the local organizations right away? Uh, no. Amy Malmgren, who, as some of you know, was, is a renowned Annapolis potter and poet, actually. And uh, she became my first teacher and mentor. Oh, I just love Ebby. Yeah. And Ebby is now almost 100 years old. Amazing. And she's still making art. Anyway, um, soon that led to courses, more formal courses, at a satellite school in Columbia, Maryland, which was established by Antioch University. And that was, that was 1976. At that time, Joan Mondale was the vice president's wife, and she was a potter. And so she was very active in uh, urging arts, governmental arts grants to arts organizations and institutions. And that's how Antioch came to establish this art school in Columbia, Maryland. Well, that was really close by. So I started taking courses there, soon realized I would take every course they had and I applied for their MFA program in ceramics, got accepted, did it. I was able to do it part time because when you have a family, you have to be available, take kids to doctor's appointments and sports and all that. Um, 
finished up there in 1981-82 and serendipitously I did an archaeological thesis because I had to adapt my desires in art to the family situation and I couldn't be off traveling to Asia or hmm. Middle East or whatever. I was very interested in Mid-Eastern glazes but that didn't pan out. So I did a, a, you know, a project that involved um, a collection of sherds that were available at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, natural history, which had never been analyzed. And so that's what I did. And worked out very well and became active in the Anne Arundel County Archaeological Society with my son, who at the time was let's say floundering and so that worked out very well um although so he made him do all the digging and cleaning and all of that yes we oh, did good. all that good, yeah good. and that was fun um and uh but the pull of asian ceramics spoke to me and i became aware of the freer museum of art and they had they had just started a docent program so I applied for that, got accepted, and spent 13 years at the Freer. And in 1987, uh, the Sackler became a reality. And it was extraordinarily exciting to be part of that. And I just loved it. Uh, however, uh, in 2000, circumstances just sort of led to stopping that, to retiring from that, and becoming a docent emeritus. Sounds so important. <laughs> um, and I retired to Annapolis, and I started writing for the Capitol. And that's how I met Heidi. And uh, what else? Well, Carol, this is a good point, I think, to sort of take a break from uh, some of the experiences you've had that have inflected your work as an artist. You, you sense I can ramble, right? No, no, I think this is a very, you've, you've led me to a point, I was sort of waiting for the point where I might interject and ask Reagan, can you, can you pull up the first slide of those slides that uh, Carol submitted to us? Uh, so anyway, I was busily doing ceramics until the early 2000s, and then physically, I began to realize lifting up 50 pound boxes of uh, clay, was becoming really onerous and I was using a slab roller and an extruder uh, and still throwing on the wheel and that eventually led to a hand operation um, so this was not good so I said well I think I'm gonna have to stop doing ceramics and find something else and I thought okay well let's try welding where I got that from <laughs> I have no idea to move to but a lighter material I, Right, a young, well, it's just being uh, large scale pretentious. <laughs> so a young man came to repair our tram and he was a welder. And I just sat there watching this welding going on. And I said, uh, have you ever thought about making art? And he said, duh, no. And I said, would you like to? And he said, well, okay, that's interesting. So long story short, I designed some pieces on the computer and uh, he ordered the stainless steel, and I went out there with my newly purchased steel-toed boots, uh, and he was gonna teach me how to weld. So he puts on the helmet and the glasses, and I can't see a thing, and I'm stumbling around, and he says, oh, well, you can't see anything until I turn on the welder, arc welder. So he turns it on, and this thing is close to me and it's spouting sparks all over, including all over me. And I am petrified. So we start doing the welding. He's holding my hands, I guess. I don't remember. And we do a bunch of welds and we finish one piece. That's not the piece, which is on the back of our property and it's kinetic. It actually moves. It's kind of neat, moves with the wind. And then this was my second and my swan song. So we did this one together. It's a couple dancing. So it's Richard and me when we took ballroom dancing lessons, although I don't expect you to recognize that. Um, 
he, I, I have to confess that he sort of finished it up because I never did get used to uh, the fire. I was absolutely petrified. And you just said something, so Carol, that. that's shocking to me. This is your swan song as a metal sculptress. Mm -hmm. And you only made two pieces. Only made two pieces, right. Okay. I'm going to do a little art historian shtick here, if you don't mind. How big is the piece of jewelry on the far left? Oh, it's tiny. Uh, this big. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And how large are the works in the center that are on the table? Oh, those are good size. I mean, I think you can the two or three feet. It was church. I, I also, I used to make vessels, clay vessels for Ikebana. And so that was an exhibition of Ikebana uh, at a church. And that was an altar table. Okay. But are they copper tubes or wires? Oh, yeah. Did it's you do that? It's plumbing tube. Yeah, I bent it. Yes. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Okay. The, the boxes are made out of clay. Fire so. clay. Were you intentionally continuing certain formal aspects of your work as you moved through your career? I think so. I've always been interested in, in volume and space, negative space, minimalism, and, and a strong statement. If I were, as an art historian, to have interpreted the uh, large sculptural piece as grass blowing in the wind or leaves blowing in the wind. Now you described it as being inspired by you and your husband dancing. Right. Would that make any difference to you? Would that put you no. off, offend you? Or Not at all, because you bring up an interesting point. I think that art is only complete when it's viewed by somebody and they bring their own life experiences to it and they interpret it. And I think that's wonderful. You know, so when I go and I fall into a Rothko, I'm experiencing something very different than what he may or may not have intended. But yep. isn't it great that it speaks yep. to me? So, if, if what I make can speak to other people, it doesn't really matter what I made, what uh, I intended. Carol and I only briefly have ever touched on this point before, but I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I didn't encourage her to say this. This is Carol speaking for herself, but um, I think that's really what you as an artist have to, I feel, I have to accept. I put something out and however a person responds to that is, not only right, if you will, but that's what art is for, so that we can communicate with other people and it stimulate them, inspire them, or at least interest them. So that, Carol, that was just very well said. Let's roll down to the um, next image because you mentioned a name that I'm sure everybody listening, okay, if we can just stop there for a moment, please, uh, Reagan, thank you. Um, a lot of artists are reluctant to mention the name of somebody as important, as renowned, as admired as Rothko. Others should be embarrassed to say that or hesitant to say that. In your case, I never thought of that myself when I looked at your work, but as soon as you said it, I thought, oh, well, of course. Mm. So. Can you talk a little bit about your engagement with artists like Rothko, like these, you know, these part of the canon of modern art? Right, or freight train. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I really, really like the post-World War II uh, abstract expressionists. I, and leading into the 50s with Franz Klein, Helen Frankenfaller, Morris Lewis. Not that you can see that in my work necessarily. 
um, I, I like to layer my work. And so I do several uh, similar things at the same time and try and stop myself and let things dry and germinate and then get to the next part. So and when you talk about what well, this is a wonderful selection that you presented here, these three pieces together, because you go from something that's so atmospheric and fluid on the far left uh, through pieces that do even in reproduction on a uh, computer screen look more layered and as though they have thicker, more active surfaces. And then there's that wonderful line that sweeps, sweeps through the piece on the far right. Um, well, and, and that's, that's really from my love of calligraphy, which I didn't, when I was learning for the past 12 years, since I started doing painting really more seriously, um, that was quiet. And then all of a sudden, about a year and a half ago, I started making marks. Oh, I took a workshop, and that's what led to that. So there's also a lot of stuff underneath those layers that may or may not come through. Uh, lately, it's been sort of political rantings uh, underneath. Uh -huh. um, but in any case, I, I love the calligraphic. Well, um, and oh, and if I can say something else, yes. most lately, and I see Grace's here, um, I serendipitously in November went to a luncheon that a friend of mine throws every so often, and she invites women, women who she feels would be interested in speaking with each other, people from different fields. Uh, so I had the opportunity to meet Grace Cavalieri, who happens to be the Poet Laureate of Maryland. And don't be embarrassed, Grace, but I was smitten. She is so fluent in language, so articulate and musical um, that I think everybody in our little group was smitten. And by the end of our luncheon, she had agreed to do a workshop. Well, instead of being a one-off, it has turned into a once every two week meeting. Now we're meeting on Zoom and we have homework. So she's running this uh, like a course. And it has been so explosive for me because, well, for all of us, we all communicate that we are learning so much about our interior lives through the writing of poetry. Anyway, bringing it back to my art. So a couple of weeks ago, I thought, there's gotta be a way I can combine. Okay, this was an old painting. It's quite large, it's uh, 30 by 30. Um, and so there was lots, lots of acrylic underneath that had dried. And I, I washed it with a, you know, a white sort of glaze uh, and then a beige glaze and then some more writing and then the final. Um, and I've been fascinated lately with Nico, nickel azo uh, acrylic paint because it's transparent and rather metallic. Um, so that's the, the whatever you want to call it in the middle, trees or whatever. To me, it's just figure. Uh -huh. And then, and then I put uh, not real poems, but it's called a semic writing. It's sort of meaningless, meaningless use of words on the right. And that was just sort of a test because I haven't gotten brave enough to really write one of my poems on the painting. Um, and the next one, the blue and the green, I really wanted to make something that was a little more atmospheric. Um, and I've been working in cold wax and oil as well as acrylic. So acrylic, and two slides ago, I forgot to point out that was cold wax and oil. And you get a very different surface in that. It's very soft. So we're trying to do that in acrylic. Um, and what I may do is combine and actually do cold wax over 
something like this. Um, anyway, this one has some French quotations uh, in French from it. And the next couple, I think I'll really do poems of my own. Poems of your own. Maybe. Well, Carol, you're, you're, you've been working as an artist for some time and worked through different media. And now you've reached a stage where I can see many, many layers uh, in your work that are both have to do with media, have to do with composition and design and color and atmosphere and space. And now you've introduced the written word and the idea of um, uh, almost a kind of synesthetic uh, synesthesia uh, into your work. Um, so it might be a good place unless you want to say something about even more recent things, but it sounds like we've caught right up to the present time, maybe a time to stop and, and take some questions. You know, in telling your story about uh, your parents' suggest, uh, suggestions as far as careers and the way you did things and going to, uh, you said Art Students League, uh, th th that's interesting. I am a depression child, okay? And so I was directed away from art, even though I was taken to Pratt classes huh. when, between the ages of nine and 13 or 14 or something like that. But I also had an interest in science, so my parents directed me uh, that that way. Another interesting thing, my wife, who's sitting here, has done some ceramics at Corcoran a long time ago and has not picked it not picked it up again. We have some very, very nice pieces that she did. The stuff that I saw particularly that red piece that you did, absolutely, absolutely uh, gorgeous. It's too bad you had the hand problems that you couldn't continue with the ceramics. And now I have a question. Are all the paintings acrylic? No. Um, a couple of them are cold wax and oil, which is a fairly new technique where you mix oil paint with, with wax, which looks like Crisco, but you charge more for it, so I guess it's not Crisco. Uh, I did that years ago, actually, in one of the painting classes at Montgomery College. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, Is it's, it anything like encaustic, Carol? Uh, yeah, I, I believe it. It's easier than encaustic because, uh, you're, you don't have to work hot. You're working at room temperature. Is that correct, Carol? Yep, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay, I've said my uh, piece. Okay, anybody else? Thanks, Maurice. Anybody else have a question? I see a question in Please? the chat. Um, yes. They would love to hear about your method of oil and wax, Carol. Oh, in what manner? I mean, you just mix, you know, equal quantities of it and that's it. You go to work. Uh, you use uh, cooking oil to clean your brushes. So th now the only problem for me is that it takes an inordinate amount of time for it to dry. And I get very uh, bored and anxious with it. Uh, I, I want to plunge right in. So, you know, you have to have patience with it. Uh, Carol, do you mix it on the palette or do you need a little container to mix it in? Uh, I use freezer paper. I put it on a tray. I squeeze out quantities of each, mix them up with little wooden sticks, and then apply it with any kind of tools you like. You can use brushes. You can use spatulas. So Which it becomes a little more tactile, a little more like ceramic. Yeah, I suppose that's true. 
You can't stick your fingers in it. But yeah. then I stick my fingers in acrylic too, so. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, I think Julius uh, had a question. When we had the slide where the three uh, paintings were next to each other, the, there was a blue-green one on the left side and the one with the line on the right side. Uh, when I looked at them, uh, I was impressed by the visuals and I was wondering about sizes. And to me, uh, they would look really stunning, quite large, but I don't know how big you work on uh, and, and how does painting in size affect the way that you think about what you're, what you're creating? Mm. Well, I started out wanting to paint great big, masculine, powerful pieces. Then I found out the canvases cost a lot of money. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I've had to be a little smaller. Now, my husband cuts me also panels of, Richard, what do you call that stuff? Medium density. What? Medium density of fiberboard. Oh, fiberboard. We used to call it masonite, but I, you know, he said medium intensity fiberboard. Density. density fiberboard. So he cuts me different size panels, and the largest ones I've worked in are about three feet by three feet thus far, because they're also heavy and they're unwieldy. Um, would, you, would you still want to work on a very large scale if you could? You mean like Pollock did or? Yeah, you, you know, it's not eight by 12 or feet. Well, would you do that if you could? I suppose, although I guess I envision something like that as being a journey from left to right or up mm -hmm. to down or, yeah. It would be challenging in terms of making a coherent uh, overall statement. Right, right. But you're, I, uh, I'm sort of taking off on what Julius was uh, talking about, I think. Um, your works, when I look at them, are hard on the screen to envision exactly what size they are because they, they don't seem sort of delicate and jewel-like and they have an expansiveness that I could imagine being much larger. Yeah, they're all they're all about thirty by thirty. A nice size for a living room. Exactly. <laughs> Anybody else? Questions? I'm wondering if someone uh, on this conversation who has a, a greater grasp of art history than I have, which is very meager, uh, could confirm my impression that um, that Rembrandt among other things he added to his paint, would add wax, would add ground glass, would add all manner of things to create texture and, uh, and relief on the surface of the painting, even though these were not abstract paintings. Um, these were portraits and figurative work. And I also have the impression that he would occasionally go back, and this is my question to you, Carol, whether you've ever done this sort of thing where you have that much texture on the surface, and then he would go back with um, a glaze, a paint glaze, and by wiping the high relief of the texture, he would get a lot of interesting depth on the surface of his of his painting, um, I just don't know if when you've used wax mixed with oils, um, you've done and you say it takes forever to dry. I don't know if you've gone back and done any additional layering or treatment afterward. Oh yeah, I do. I I keep them, and I keep going back to them. And then the final treatment is when it's completely dry. You just put a coating of wax over to protect and also to give it added depth. So, so, so is that wax that you put over at the end uh, utterly transparent? Is it, what does it do in terms of matte or gloss or what does this covering do? It's slightly cloudy, it's, it's matte. Okay. 
So do, you, do, do you ever varnish these work? About Rembrandt. <laughs> yeah. Carol, I'll jump Carol, in on Rembrandt in a moment. Yeah. But, but Carol, do you ever varnish these things? I varnish the acrylic ones, yes. Oh. If I, but you see, I've just decided I'm not necessarily going to do that. I'm mm -hmm. going to try doing the wax over. We'll see. Mm -hmm. I'll try on smaller ones and see how it works, if it makes a difference. Um, Sandy, uh, I'll take on the Rembrandt part, the materials part. I did retire six years ago and I haven't kept up with my art historical reading, so I'm probably out of date. Um, but I don't ever recall reading of him adding materials to the paint surface. Uh, all the things you said about wiping and sort of, you know, going back uh, and, and varnishing and all of that, yes, that's definitely part of what he did. But I don't recall reading about him adding things to the paint material itself. Huh. Well, I, I, can, I can only tell you that I got that impression, Will, from a Rembrandt workshop I attended once, okay. which was fascinating to watch. I did not try to duplicate what I was seeing, but the palette that was employed had, was almost like a hardware store of uh, ingredients mm -hmm. that, uh, that I believe were uh, based on authenticated uh, conservator research of Rembrandt's paintings where they okay. had found these materials in his paintings. And he would get these really long tails on his brush strokes, just thick, stringy, yeah. red, white mixed in that gets very stringy. And so he, if you looked really close, if you looked with a magnifying glass at some of his most famous paintings, the, the network that's created oh, yeah. on the surface, sure. the canvas is very elaborate. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Um, I remember on the art history side, my art history is very limited, but I think Vermeer used to add sand to his paintings to get some depth. Um, but also, uh, Mom, I was curious, how did you get from the jewelry back to the painting? And then how did you oh. get, and then how did you get from watercolor uh, well, into saw, oils? Oh, I wasn't even going to mention that, but, um, <laughs> uh, well, you've had the, such the a jewelry thorough. came about, the, the, the jewelry came about because I had stopped doing the clay and I was feeling very guilty and I thought, okay, well, that welding thing didn't really work out and I should be doing, okay. So precious metal clay had just been invented by the Japanese and what it is, is they take um, uh, pure silver, fine silver, and they suspend it in uh, some sort of solution with fillers organic fillers and when you get it in a little package it looks like clay and so I said okay I can use clay techniques on a miniature level and make things so that's what I did and that's where that pin came about and then after it was oh and you fire in a glass kill and so what happens is the organic materials burn away because you're firing at 1800 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, the silver molecules knit and become solid silver, compress. Uh, so you end up with hard jewelry. Um, and so what I did with that pin was just make holes in it um, afterwards with a drill and thread through and, oh, and I guess the glass, I did dichroic glass mixtures. I had this glass kill and I did study glass making for a while. Um, so I did those first. I made all these cabochons out of glass and then I set it in the silver when it was wet, fired the whole thing, and then added um, uh, the wire afterwards. And so they became just little sculptures. Great. Well, um, Carol, I'm very impressed with your work, as I've told you, and as I mentioned at the beginning, and I think it's fascinating the way that you have worked both with your hands in three-dimensional uh, materials like clay and metal, 
but there's this consistency and this continued sort of layering and complexity in your work that is very surprising because of the different media that you've employed. So I, I want to thank you personally for taking the time to talk with us. And uh, it's been fascinating to learn more about your work and how you've come to uh, what you're doing today. I hope everybody else has enjoyed it. And um, I think we'll get back together uh, next week. And I hope oh, you'll join us then. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, it's Tali. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to make a comment that I found um, your work has really uh, a uh, visceral, really or, uh, spiritual and organic um, depth to it. Uh, and I, it, it, just and especially in, uh, going from the sculpture, it's just um, it has really um, such an incredible flow, and and I love the paintings too because I felt like it has a um, very meditative. And I don't know if if that's part of your life at all. Do you, uh, um, that I, I see in your painting um, that sort of uh, uh, meditative quality. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay well thanks everybody uh hope i'll see you again next week next tuesday at five o'clock thank you thank all you so thank much. you carol thank you reagan of course bye all bye everyone bye, -bye. bye, -bye.